Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Micro Raptor, and we have some exciting dinosaur news. Our dinosaur news is always exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. Before we get into that, though, we just want to shout out to our patrons. Thank you so much. We're now up to, what is it, $81 a month? That's huge. Yeah. And when we get to 200 we're going to send out stickers to everybody. Yay, stickers. <laughs> we hope you like stickers. If you're listening to our podcast and you enjoy hearing about all the dinosaurs and dinosaur news, then please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I know dino. First in the news is an article published in Nature's Scientific Reports. It's titled, A Bizarre Theropod from the Early Cretaceous of Japan, Highlighting Mosaic Evolution Among Silurosaurians. And it was written by Yoichi Azuma and others. So, back in 2007, this team found a nearly complete specimen from the Lower Cretaceous, which is about 120 million years ago, give or take couple dozen million years and they found it in the kitadani formation in fukui japan and we talk about fukui a lot apparently it's a pretty happening place for dinosaurs they found 160 individual fossils including almost all of the vertebrae and most of the skull arms legs hands feet and ribs it's pretty much just missing most of the pelvis and then just bits and pieces throughout the rest of its body. Its full name is Fukui Venator Paradoxus, or a paradoxical hunter of Fukui. And the Fukui is pretty obvious why it's called that. The paradoxical part is because of the surprising combination of features. So I'll get into that more in a minute. It set a record as the most complete non-avialin dinosaur ever discovered in Japan, according to the authors, and although it's not fully grown, they estimate that it was about 245 centimeters or 8 feet long and weighed about 25 kilograms or 55 pounds when it died. At first look, it looks a lot like a dromaeosaur with a bigger claw sticking up out of one toe and the shape of its head and body, but when you look at it more closely, you see that the teeth aren't just for meat, and that there are lots of other little subtle differences, so it's not just a dromaeosaur. So the authors say that it does have the most in common with dromaeosaurids, but it also has some small details in common with Archaeopteryx, Ornithomimosaurs, Trudontids, and other Manoraptorans. So it's kind of a amalgamation of different features like they have in their title, the mosaic. So they put it in as a basal manoraptorin, which makes it the predecessor to most of the raptors or dromaeosaurs, largely because, quote, Fukui venator represents a bizarre silurosaurian not assignable to any known silurosaurian subgroup, end quote. So they really don't know exactly where to put it, so most of the things just call it a manoraptorin, or they say that it's dromaeosaur-like in some ways, but it's really a pretty unique dinosaur. And it's pretty basal, meaning early in the evolutionary tree of Manoraptorans, so it's not too surprising that it has features in common with different groups that evolved out from that point. According to the Japan Times, it is the, quote, seventh new dinosaur discovery confirmed in Japan, end quote. Wow. Yeah, and that's pretty good for a small island. You can get seven dinosaurs. <laughs> and it seems like a lot of them come from this Fukui area, because we get that in the news a lot. I know there's a big research group there that works on dinosaurs, which might be a lot of it, and then they have the museum too, but it's pretty cool. The authors believe that it may have had the hearing ability of modern birds based on CT scans of the inner ear that looked similar to modern birds. And based on its teeth... They think that it was probably omnivorous and not just a simple carnivore like most Romaeosaurids look like with their sharp teeth. This one had multiple different kinds of teeth that looked more omnivorous, kind of like people. And due to its lineage, they are guessing that it probably had feathers too. So the pictures that they made of it have feathers all over. Them. It's a pretty cool dinosaur. It's really impressive how much of it they found. They have one of those pictures where they show 
all the bones and they color some of them one color if they found it and the other one's another color to show that they're guessing at what it looks like. And in the whole tale, I think there was only one vertebrae that was missing out of like 30 and they had all the ribs and just tons of stuff. So it's pretty cool. It is. A lot of times they find, you know, just part of a skull and then they talk about the length of the dinosaur and how much it weighed and things. And there's a lot of extrapolating and assumptions you have to do with similar family members. Sometimes that doesn't work so well, like with Therizinosaurus for a long time. (laughs) Yep. And next in the news, researchers have found a fossilized femur of a pregnant T-Rex, which actually brought this up at a party the other day. (laughs) It's amazing how many cool tidbits you can bring up when you know a lot about dinosaurs. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Anyway... This pregnant T-Rex can help paleontologists figure out gender differences in T-Rex as well as how egg laying evolved. The study is from North Carolina State University and the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and the study is called Chemistry Supports the Identification of Gender-Specific Reproductive Tissue in Tyrannosaurus Rex, and was published in Nature by Mary Higby Schwetzer, Wenxia Zheng, Lindsay Zano, Sarah Wernung, and Toshi Sugiyama. The researchers found medullary bone, quote, an estrogen-dependent reproductive tissue present in extant gravid birds, end quote, in the femur. Which basically means, do you want to explain it, Garrett? Yeah, medullary bone is stuff that basically modern birds have to support the process of laying eggs. I think it's like they use it to store up certain minerals and then they can kind of use that repository when they're making eggs or something like that. But it's something that only the female birds have because... And only when they're about to lay an egg. Yeah, because the male ones, you know, obviously aren't laying eggs, so they don't have this kind of bone. Yep. This particular bone was found back in 2005, but the findings weren't confirmed until recently. And Mary said, quote, There are some bone diseases that occur in birds, like osteopetrosis, that can mimic the appearance of medullary bone under the microscope. So to be sure, we needed to do chemical analysis of the tissue, end quote. Just happened to have from an article, I think we talked about last week, a list of all the different abnormalities in bones that birds can have. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. I just happened to have a list of abnormalities. (laughs) Yes. So osteopetrosis is on the list. It says it's an extreme enlargement of diameter of diaphysis of long bones starting at mid-diaphysis and proceeding toward metaphysis. The tibia and metatarsus are affected first, followed by other long bones and ribs and bones of the pectoral and pelvic girdles, but not digits. So... It's like inflammation of the bones, it sounds like. That's quite an interesting thing. It would make sense that that would be, well, not really inflammation. Yeah. Sounds painful. Yeah. And you could see how it would, it could get mixed up if you have one condition that causes bones to enlarge and a different one that causes bones to have extra deposits in them. Yeah. So before this find, scientists didn't think that dinosaur bones could preserve things like medullary bone, which has keratin sulfate. For millions of years, at least, so it's kind of a bit of luck that they found it, since it's only there during egg laying. Yeah. And Lindsay Zano of the study said that this finding will, quote, open up a whole new world of possibilities, so it's pretty exciting. Yeah, that's cool. I think they've discovered medullary bone in the past, but maybe it was more speculative then. Could be. I mean, it took them a long time to confirm that this was the case. Yeah, I don't remember them talking about confirming it versus other possibilities then. Cool. Next to the news is an article that we got from Chris via Twitter, so thanks for tweeting at us about this one. (laughs) It's an article titled, New Tyrannosaur from the Mid-Cretaceous of Uzbekistan Clarifies Evolution of Giant Body Sizes and Advanced Senses in Tyrant Dinosaurs. And this one was pretty widely reported in the general media probably because it has to do with T-Rex, and everybody loves to talk about (laughs) (laughs) T-Rex. So it was originally published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and it was written by Stephen L. Broussat and others. He's come up a few times recently. Mm -hmm. Before this find, there was a gap from about 100 to 80 million years ago we hadn't discovered any tyrannosauroids from. So we didn't know when T-Rex evolved its characteristic traits 
basically the three of them that they talk about are its big head that has some pneumaticity, its bigger body than Tyrannosaurus had been, and its good senses. So we knew it was sometime in the period from 100 to 65 million years ago, and that was about it, or maybe 100 to 70 million years ago. Really narrowed it down. Yeah. But researchers in the Bisecti Formation in the Kizilcum Desert in northern Uzbekistan just found a new tyrannosauroid that they're calling Timurlengia uatica. Apparently, Uzbekistan is the place to be if you want to learn about the Middle Cretaceous because a lot of the world was underwater and it's just difficult to find land-dwelling fossils all over the place. So the genus is named after Timurling, who founded the Timurid Empire in the 14th century, and that's in present-day Uzbekistan, which kind of explains why they picked him. And the specific name is Greek for (laughs) well-eared. It's got some good ears. (laughs) Yes, it does, in fact. (laughs) So they didn't find nearly as many of the bones as they did with Fukuivenator that we just talked about. And they believe that the few bones that they did find are even from different individuals. And the article is behind a paywall, so I couldn't get the exact number. But it looks like they found about 20 bones. Most of them are vertebrae and teeth. But luckily, they found the brain case, which is what you want to find if you want to see what it could hear and, you know, how it might have thought. You can see different lobes and whatnot. Specifically from the brain case, they found that it had large inner ears with a long cochlea, which would have enabled it to hear low-frequency sounds better than most other dinosaurs. And they postulate that T. rex may have become such a successful predator because of these enhanced senses. So if you can hear lower notes, you can hear things moving around a little bit, and then obviously if you can hear better, that also helps. So Tyrannosaurids meaning the Tyrannosaur family, specifically that group that's very, you know, defined, (laughs) lived from about 80 to 66 million years ago. And they guessed that this find is right in the 90 to 92 million years ago range. And they put it in the Tyrannosauroid superfamily. So that's Tyrannosaurids and then a bunch of other dinosaurs that are closely related to Tyrannosaurs, but they aren't actually in the Tyrannosaur family. So it's not directly in the Tyrannosaur family, but may have evolved into T-Rex, may have just been like a relative. It's a little bit difficult to tell right now. In the phylogenetic tree that they published, they put it off to the side like a separate little branch. But they estimate that Timurlengia had an estimated weight of 550 pounds or 250 kilograms, and it is described as horse-sized which I think is kind of funny. And it had already developed the sensory features that T-Rex would eventually inherit from either Timurlengia or another cousin that, you know, had the same common ancestor. So the discovery also shows that T-Rex got its massive size relatively quickly because we know that as recently as 90 million years ago, it was still horse-sized and then it got to that massive basically 10 times, 12 times the size of this dinosaur in just those 10 million years or something. It's kind of like we talked about the other discovery where they found that dinosaurs evolved relatively quickly in their very beginnings in the Triassic. Now we're finding out that T-Rex evolved to be big in a pretty short span at the end of the dinosaurs. Found an opportunity. Yeah, exactly. The researchers point out that Timurlengia didn't have the pneumaticity or air spaces in its skull yet, and T-Rex would have had to evolve those pretty quickly too. And then most of the news stories, if you've read anything about this, point to maybe the key fact that they keep repeating, which is basically T-Rex developed its enhanced senses and brain power before it got big. So you can infer causation there if you want and say, T-Rex got this ability to hear prey all over the place better than other animals, and then it used that ability in order to take over the food chain and eventually get huge. So it's pretty cool. Yep. It's interesting that there were two findings about inner ears in the same week. It was. <laughs> Where, yeah, one can hear like a bird and the other one can hear lower notes than a bird, so. But I do think more people knew about Timurlingia 
at least the finding, because your mom texted us about it. That's true. When non-dinosaur people start finding out about things, new dinosaur discoveries, you know that it's hitting all sorts of mass media. Yes. Probably because it's related to T-Rex. Always. Anything about <laughs> T-Rex always pops up. So next, a study from the University of Utah found two genes that have some pigeons develop feathers on their feet, while other types of pigeons have scales. The genes are PITX1, which is a hind limb development gene that is not as active on pigeons with feathers on their feet, and TBX5, which is a forelimb development gene that is more active on pigeons with feathers on their feet. Mike Shapiro, the senior author of the study, said that, quote, pigeons' fancy feathered feet are partially wings, end quote. Hmm. Some dinosaurs also had feathers on their feet, possibly raptors and T-Rex as an example, and it's unclear if the two genes PITX1 and TBX5 played a part in dinosaurs having feathered feet, but according to Shapiro, quote, we have no direct way of knowing how that change occurred in dinosaurs. However, we see a lot of striking anatomical similarities between dinosaurs' feathered legs and feet and pigeons with feathered legs and feet. So pigeons might give us some insights into how the skin knows to develop scales or feathers, end quote. Yeah, that's interesting. I've noticed on chickens, too, they usually have scales on their feet, but every once in a while there's a couple of feathers sticking out of it. Mm -hmm. and it looks kind of goofy, but it must be this interaction between the genes. And next in the news, in Arkansas, 17-year-old Cypress Ori is pushing to recognize Arkansaurus Friday Eye to be the state's official dinosaur. Quote, it's the only dinosaur that truly bleeds razorback red, he said. Arkansaurus was a bipedal theropod that ate small animals, insects, and eggs, as well as some fruits and leaves. It may have been between 6 to 15 feet tall or even taller, and it had a long, slender neck and a small head. It had a pretty big brain, too, and large eyes and grasping hands. Cypressori made a website, and he started a petition, and he uploaded videos on YouTube to get Arkansas to name this dinosaur as the state dinosaur. And he even wrote legislation and contacted state politicians, and after three years, he expects it to pass in early 2017. So good for him, for his dedication. Yeah. His efforts are also helping to spark an interest in dinosaurs in Arkansas. And he said, quote, in a way I've awakened the inner child in everyone, end quote. And that's one of the things I love about dinosaurs is how it brings out this like childlike quality in everyone. Yeah. It's cool when states have state dinosaurs, too, because not all of them do. Some of them just have a state fossil mm -hmm. and it's not always a dinosaur. It's true. Next is a fun little tidbit. A photographer named Jorge Saenz has a travel series called hashtag Dino Dina series. Could also be Dino Dina series. They quote, document the dinosaur tourists travels around South America, end quote, with his toy Dino, the green Brachiosaurus. I say Dino because I think of the Flintstones, but it might be just Dino. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's also Dina, another reason to go with Dino. So Dina, the Stegosaurus, Spiny, the Spinosaurus, and Brachy, a brown Brachiosaurus, and also Dino's girlfriend. Photos show the dinosaurs looking out of an airplane window, climbing a mountain, hanging out on the beach, and more. We'll post it. I think the title of the article I found was something like, Dinosaur Toys Make All Photos Better or something. <laughs> <laughs> and he does a good job. The Nutch channel on YouTube has created a fun video that shows you how to make a clay apatosaurus, and the video ends with a short stop motion clip of the apatosaurus. And That sounds fun. It's really awesome. I also just love stop motion, so combining the two is great. Yeah, that is cool. I like watching the one Twilight Zone episode where they fly to New York, and when they're going to land in the airport, they've accidentally gone back in time, and there's all these claymation dinosaurs <laughs> done by stop motion. Yeah. Those are fun. I just want to give a quick shout out to Matt Zilla, who posted on our Facebook page this amazing picture of a stop motion dinosaur puppet that he's working on. Cool. Looks like it's of a stegosaurus. It's really awesome looking. So Matt Zilla, whatever your next project is, please let us know. Yeah, that's cool. In China, a pickup truck drove with a dinosaur whacking its tail on the back. Well, I don't know if it was actually wagging its tail. I was just picturing it wagging its tail. <laughs> just assume wagging. <laughs> yeah. The dinosaur is an animatronic one that was on its way to an amusement park. 
Apparently, a couple days before that, someone had filmed an animatronic T-Rex riding in the back of another truck in the same area. So. Oh, yeah. I saw that one. Its head was, like, sticking out, facing the cars behind it. <laughs> <laughs> and last, my coworkers, who know how much I love dinosaurs, shared this one with me. There's a couple dinosaur games that you can play in your browser. There's Off-Road Velociraptor Safari and Jetpack Brontosaurus. So off-road Velociraptor Safari is, quote, about the journey of a raptor who is on a mission to run down prehistoric brethren in the past to harvest them as taco meat for the future. You need to drive a vehicle which is equipped with a spiked ball and chain. The ball can be deployed from the tailgate as many times as the smart driver wishes. Kill other Velociraptors with your Jeep and exit the game as a winner. <laughs> <laughs> And Jetpack Brontosaurus is a game where you fly on a brontosaurus and collect fruits, which sounds great. You fly on a brontosaurus. I didn't say the games were realistic. <laughs> so the brontosaurus has the jetpack and then you're on the jet, or you play as the brontosaurus? You play, I think, as a person on the brontosaurus and the brontosaurus is flying via a jetpack. Huh. And collecting fruits for some reason. That's very complex for collecting fruit. It is. <laughs> so if anybody's played these games, please let us know. We'd love to hear more. So now on to the dinosaur of the day, Microraptor, which was a request from Guy via Patreon. So thank you. And I hope I am pronouncing that right, but please correct me if I'm wrong. So Microraptor means small thief, and it lived in the Cretaceous, and its fossils were found in Liaoning, China. There are three species, Microraptor jiaoyanus, Microraptor gui, and Microraptor hanqingyi. Some scientists think that they are all one species, which would be Microraptor jiaoyanus. There's a synonym for Microraptor too, it's Cryptovolvans, which was another four-winged dinosaur. So Microraptor was named by Xu Xing and others in 2000. Its naming was actually pretty controversial because it was revealed that the first specimen described was actually the tail of a microraptor, but the upper body of Yanornis and a third species that was put together in China and it was smuggled into the U.S. for sale. Yeah, that happens sometimes. You stick a couple fossils together to make it look like a complete fossil. Mm -hmm. So when Xu Xing from Beijing's Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology revealed it was a forgery, Stores Olson, who's the bird curator at the National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian, wrote a description of the tail and named it Archiroraptor leoningensis. Later, Xu Xing found the rest of Microraptor to go with the tail, which, again, that part was Microraptor, and officially described it, but with the name Microraptor jiaoyanus. Since the name Archiroraptor and Microraptor referred to the same specimen, normally the Microraptor name would have been a junior synonym of Achiroraptor, since it was officially named afterwards. But Achiroraptor was revealed to be fake before it was officially named. Olsen had tried to assign the name Achiroraptor to just the tail part of Microraptor to remove this taint. So Achiroraptor, the tail part, was named as Electotype which is a name from a group of specimens with the same name. But since Achiroraptor wasn't officially named, it was only named in the media, not in the scientific world, this name didn't count, and that's why the name Microraptor prevailed. In December 2015, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement officials said that they were returning a Microraptor fossil to China, so I wonder how many Microraptor fossils made it over here. Yeah, <laughs> hiding in people's secret fossil rooms. <laughs> yeah. So going back to Microraptor's other synonym, Cryptovolans. Cryptovolans poly, specifically, that name means hidden flying, and the species name honors Gregory S. Paul, and it was described in 2002. It was also found in Liaoning, China, and it lived at the same time as Microraptor. The scientists who described Cryptovolans thought it was a bird because it had primary feathers, which were on the arm and leg, but later studies found that it was very similar to Microraptor. It had a longer tail, but it had other features in common. And in 2004, Phil Center and colleagues suggested Cryptovolans poly and Microraptor gui were junior synonyms of Microraptor jiaoyanus, and other scientists have supported this. Stephen Cherkas said when describing Cryptovolans that Microraptor may have been a better flyer than Archaeopteryx, and that Dromaeosauridae may have been a basal bird group, and that basal dromaeosaurs were small, lived in trees, and could at least glide. Later discoveries of more primitive dromaeosaurs with short forelimbs, though, meant that they couldn't all glide. Over 300 specimens of Microraptor have been found. They were very abundant in their ecosystem. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. 
They're similar to synovenator, which is a basal trudontid, probably because they're both primitive members of two groups that are closely related and are close to the split between dromaeosaurids and trudontids. Microraptor was small and it had four wings. It was crow-sized. An adult Microraptor was 1.4 to 2.7 feet, 42 to 83 centimeters long, and weighed up to 2.2 pounds, or one kilogram. I love that they have four wings, too. I can't think of any other non-insect that has four wings. It's so cool. Yeah, I guess just dinosaurs. In 2012, Benson estimated that Microraptor, though, was 3.9 feet, or 1.2 meters long. Microraptor is one of the smallest non-avian dinosaurs that we know of. It is one of the first non-avian dinosaurs found with impressions of feathers and wings, and it shows the evolution between birds and dinosaurs. Its body was covered in feathers with a diamond-shaped fan on the end of the tail. It had long feathers on its arms, tail, and legs. In 2003, Xu Xing described the first Microraptor specimen as having four wings and said it may have been able to glide. There's been debate over whether or not Microraptor could also fly. It's one of the few dinosaurs known to have had long flight feathers on its legs as well as its wings. Its primary feathers were on the hand and foot, and secondary feathers on the arm and legs. In 1915, William Beebe said that birds may have had four wings at some point. So he kind of predicted this find. At first, scientists thought that Microraptor kept its arms and legs level when flying, or they overlapped each other. But in 2005, Sankar Chatterjee said that this was not possible, and instead the legs were on a different level but parallel to the arms so that from the front it looked like it had two pairs of wings. He also said in 2005 that in order to glide, Microraptor launched from a perch, swooped down into a U-shaped curve, and then lifted again, landing on another tree. Using computer algorithms, he found that Microraptor would have been able to fly at least on occasion in addition to gliding. That's cool. He called this the biplane method, but not all scientists agreed with this method. (laughs) The biplane method? (laughs) Yes. That's funny. Microraptor may have had multiple ways of flying or flying. It's unclear whether Microraptor held its legs directly under its body or if its legs were splayed to the side when in the air. Knowing this would help scientists understand how it flew or glided, but often its hips and upper leg fossils are found crushed, so it's hard to say. In 2013, researchers from the University of Southampton created a Microraptor model to experiment positions it held inside a wind tunnel. They found it worked best, quote, when the limbs were in the straight-down posture and the tail operated as a lift-generating structure. So for the wind tunnel study, they made this poseable scale model of Microraptor out of feathers from ducks and (laughs) pigeons. They tested Microraptor with sprawling limbs, limbs projecting downwards, and without hind limbs. From the Scientific American blog post that described the experiment in 2013, quote, The tail operated as a lift-generating structure, meaning that Microraptor can accurately be described as a five-winged flyer, (laughs) not just a four-winged one. Why not? (laughs) Yes. They found it could glide easily, but flying would have been difficult. There would have been too much drag. And did have five wings. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. According to the post, quote, it was well able to glide no matter what the feather or wing configuration. In fact, we concluded that all Microraptor needed in order to glide effectively was a flat wing surface. Feather asymmetry, anatomy, and configuration didn't make that much difference. This is according to Dyke et al. in 2013. A discovery which supports the view that the evolution of theropod wing and feather anatomy did not occur within an aerodynamic context. End quote. So, Microraptor probably sometimes glided, but it did not specialize in it. Not all scientists think that Microraptor could have flown or glided. Some studies found its shoulder socket face downward and backward, which meant it couldn't raise its arm vertically and flap. And some scientists said that the shoulder girdle is curved, so the shoulder joint is high on the back, allowing Microraptor to raise its arms vertically. The long wing feathers on Microraptor's arms would also have made it hard for Microraptor to run or move on the ground because they would have dragged on the ground. And its feathers would have dragged when its arms were in a neutral position, so Microraptor could not use its clawed forelimbs to go after prey or move objects without damaging its wings. Mm. It could not take off from the ground either since it would have damaged the flight feathers on its feet. Some scientists think the feathers on its feet would have made it difficult for Microraptor to run, and instead maybe it lived in trees and glided. That would make a lot of sense. Yeah. 
Research in 2012 found that Microraptor had great control over its hind wings. This helped increase, quote, its rate of turn by 33 to 50 percent compared to using only the front wings, end quote. This is according to Michael Habib from the University of Southern California, who co-presented research over Microraptor's movement at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology back in 2012. According to Justin Hall, a collaborator of the study, quote, No one's going to argue that this was the fastest animal in the ecosystem. This was an animal about the size of a crow living among predatory dinosaurs at a time when the largest animal in the air had a 15-foot, 4.6-meter wingspan. <laughs> so a 33% increase in turning speed could have meant the difference between life and death, end quote. It's like a little nimble bird rather than a big predatory bird. Yes. So again, its hind wings may have created drag, which would have made it harder to fly or glide. Quote, if you were trying to use those blocky hind wings to glide, they would be very poor at that. Uh, this is from Habib. But if you care more about a very rapid, powerful motion such as turning than you do about sustained motion, being draggy is fine. End quote. Going tree to tree sounds like a good option. Yeah. Microraptor's tail feathers, which were like a fan, would help correct the hind wings pitch so that it would not nosedive in the air. It's unclear if Microraptor was arboreal or terrestrial, but it spent at least some time in trees. Using its hind wings to increase its turning speed may give some insight into modern birds that hunt, like eagles. Paul said, quote, why do eagles stick out their legs when they fly? It looks weird, right? Well, they have a lot of feathers on those legs, so they're producing a lot of drag. It leads to the implication that they're doing it intentionally for control, end quote. Not enough fossilized feathers have been found to prove how dinosaurs evolved into birds, but Microraptor helps to fill a gap. Habib said, quote, a combination of pitch control by the tail, roll generation by the hind wings, and multi-purpose control by the main wings would have made Microraptor a highly maneuverable animal. But not all scientists are convinced of this study. Some say that it only looks at how a hind limb affects an animal that glides, not animals that flap their wings, and gliding is not necessarily part of the evolution of flight. That's true. Yeah, so there's debate over the evolution of flight. Was it from the ground up? Did fast runners become airborne or tree down? Did arboreal animals that could glide turn into flyers? There's a lot of comparison between Microraptor and Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx only had one set of wings on its front limbs. Microraptor was the first to have wings on its front and rear limbs. Microraptor lived 20 to 25 million years after Archaeopteryx, which shows that flight started evolving more than once in the Mesozoic era, though only one lineage is still around. Yeah, you also had pterodactyls too. Yeah. Could be a whole other one. That's true. Because of long leg feathers found on Microraptor as well as other raptors in Archaeopteryx, birds may have evolved from having four wings to having two front wings. Because Microraptor is in the same family as Velociraptor and Deinonychus, which lived later, they're dromaeosaurs, these raptors were probably secondarily flightless, and that means that they evolved from flying ancestors. Not everyone believes this though, and some think Microraptor is distantly related to other raptors. Microraptor had short, downy tail feathers, it had some dark and light colored feathers. Some that may have been iridescent black, like a crow's. So, very crow-like, this microraptor. <laughs> in 2012, Chuang Guo Li and a team analyzed microraptor and figured out what color it was. They examined melanosomes and compared them to modern birds, and they found it was consistent with birds with black iridescent colors, a glossy coat, which may have been used for communicating or for display. Kind of love those melanosomes. Mm-hmm. And they found that Microraptor was predominantly iridescent feathers. Interesting. One study found that Microraptor may have flashed its tail feathers like a peacock. This tail was probably used for courtship and probably not very helpful for flight. Not very aerodynamic. Eh, maybe for lift, though. There is a bird, a modern bird, that has that really long tail, too, that it flaps around and the males have it so long that they can barely fly because hmm. they have a tail kind of like what they're describing for Microraptor. Sounds like there's a lot of debate, though, over how Microraptor moved. Yeah, seriously. So, Microraptor may have eaten lizards. In 2010, scientists found preserved gut contents in a Microraptor jowianus of mammal bones, a possible skull, limb, and a whole foot. Uh-oh. In 2011, scientists officially described a Microraptor with bird bones in its abdomen, which seems to show it swallowed a whole bird, one Oof. that perched in trees based on its foot. That means it's... Probably spent some time in trees. Yeah. In 2013, scientists described fish scales found in the abdomen of a microraptor, which shows it was an opportunistic feeder and ate prey in arboreal and aquatic habitats. Well, that'd be hard to catch a fish if all you could do is glide. Yeah, you that's gotta true. go down towards the water and then somehow not accidentally land in the water. 
I guess maybe it's possible if you do that U-shaped thing they were talking about. Yeah. Risky. Yeah. It's a tasty fish. Yeah. Well, so it's unclear if Microraptor scavenged or caught fish. So that could be it, too. Maybe it's found a fish. <laughs> Just a fish hanging out on the land. Yeah. <laughs> it. I mean, it might have swooped down, as you said, but scientists aren't sure. Yeah. It did have teeth that was probably good for catching fish. It had small teeth with a forward angle like a crocodile's that were <laughs> serrated on one edge so the fish would not be ripped apart while trying to get away. Microraptor also has a scleral ring in its eyes that made scientists think it hunted at night, but if that's the case, it's not clear why it had glossy iridescent feathers. Yeah, I don't know about the leap to iridescent feathers because from what I remember with melanosomes, you could only really tell if it was black or red. Hmm. The iridescent thing is a little... Eh. Eh. Yeah, hard to say. Yeah. So Microraptor lived in a forested freshwater lake habitat and it could climb, and apparently it ate some fish. And that is <laughs> what we know. It's a dromaeosaurid, and dromaeosaurids are carnivorous theropods closely phylogenetically related to aves, which is a clad that includes birds. They probably originated before the late Jurassic, but fossil records so far is only of the Cretaceous. They lived all over the world, but there's not that many fossils. Dromaeosaurids from the late Cretaceous in North America have a poor fossil record. They're mostly known from isolated teeth. And in North America, only eight species are named, and they're all pretty much based on incomplete fossil remains. Not all, but a lot. They're often referred to as raptors because of Jurassic Park. And that book that Michael Crichton was reading when he wrote Jurassic Park, I forget what it was called. There was a book, I think he was basically saying maybe there was just one genus and it included Velociraptor and Deinonychus and stuff, and maybe they were like the same. And that's... Partly why they look the way they do in Jurassic Park. Yeah, I remember that story, but I don't remember the name of the book. Yeah. Dromaeosaurids had S-curved necks, long arms, and large hands with large claws. The feet had a recurved claw on the second toe, known as a sickle claw, and this claw may have been used for slashing, climbing, or even clawing through insect nests. At least some Dromaeosaurids uh, may have lived in groups. Most, if not all, had feathers. They were bipedal, but they held their second toe off the ground when walking, and they had long tails that may have been used to help counterbalance when running or in the air. They're generally small to medium-sized, though Utah Raptor was large. Some could fly or glide, like Chengyu Raptor Yangai, and they were very bird-like in both behavior and the fact that they had feathers. Yeah, they're one of the most popular groups of dinosaurs, for sure. After well, Tyrannosaurs? Yeah. A lot of people just think of them as velociraptors, but <laughs> there's a whole group of them. And our fun fact of the day comes from all the talk I was doing about how dinosaurs could hear. And I mentioned that Fukui Venator has hearing more similar to birds, but then the question is, what can birds hear? So it turns out birds can't hear as well as humans, and humans can't even really hear all that well. We're more of, you know, we're more sight focused. Something like a dog and other mammals can hear much wider ranges of frequencies than we can hear. And we can hear about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And birds, even though there is a fair amount of variability, like owls are more on the deeper end of the spectrum with their deep hoot, <laughs> <laughs> it tends to kind of follow along what noises you make is, you know, related to what you can hear. And then what you're doing, too, if you're hunting, you want to hear deeper notes, but... Birds tend to hear in the few hundred hertz to 10 kilohertz range. And that's partly why ultrasonic repellers don't work on birds. People will sell them to you, but they don't do anything because it's like trying to use a dog whistle on a human. You don't hear the sound. It's not going to scare you away at all. So that means that you couldn't repel dinosaurs with those ultrasonic repellers if they are around <laughs> now either. <laughs> And as an aside, a professor named Robert Dooling at the University of Maryland from the Center for Comparative and Evolutionary Biology of Hearing explained way back in 2007 that he expected larger dinosaurs to hear lower frequencies because you see that phenomenon in extant animals, like elephants hear much deeper notes and other large animals tend to be on the lower end of the spectrum. So... He didn't expect that dinosaurs could hear much above 3 kilohertz. So I thought that was kind of a fun idea because that means if you used electronics at least, humans could communicate without dinosaurs hearing us <laughs> or used other kind of acoustical. We wouldn't be able to talk because our voices are in the range they could hear, but you could like, I don't know, 
like a triangle a few <laughs> notes or something <laughs> as like a warning and the dinosaurs would have no idea you were making noise could be kind of fun could be kind of confusing if you're a dinosaur and you saw a human playing a triangle but didn't hear anything yeah i was imagining like jurassic world 2 like they suck in a bunch of helium so <laughs> their voices go really high and then none of the dinosaurs can hear them <laughs> that'd be funny yeah and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And again, if you like what you hear and want to support us, then please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.